thank you for joining us. I hope you know uh, your fall semester has started well. I know the excitement with new students and returning students on your campuses. Uh, this is the week or time that I miss most in my current role and uh, not being on campuses. Uh, you know what I'm visiting. I'm visiting uh, Warwick College this week on Friday and and other institutions. So uh, again, uh, let me uh, introduce a few new colleagues who have joined uh, Maryland Higher Education Commissions uh, since our last meeting. Uh, Kia Potit as Director of Operations. You'll we'll start hearing more from her. Kia, you want to say hello? Good morning, everyone. I am happy to be with everyone this morning. And I look forward to meeting for folks that I have not met yet. I look forward to meeting everyone in person. Thank you, Kia. Kristen Clarkson, I don't know if Kristen has joined yet. Is I'm here, Kristen... Secretary. Good, Good morning, Kristen. everyone. Kristen is our uh, Director of Communication, so you will hear a lot from her in, in coming months and years. So welcome, Kristen, to Maryland Higher Education Commission. Uh, we have extensive agenda items, so we will get started. Uh, first, approval of meeting minutes for April April 14, 2024 minutes. Do we have? Do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Any discussion? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Abstentions? Objections? Well, minutes are approved. Um, we are going to make a couple of changes in the agenda. Uh, our financial aid people have to, to be somewhere else later. So I'm going to ask Al Dorset to give update on the student financial aid programs first, then I'll come we'll come back to other agenda items. Al. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Secretary. Um in regards to financial aid, there was a request for an update um specifically on the GA. Uh, for the GA program, uh, which includes, or the EEA program, which would include at this point in time, uh, the EA initial and renewals, the GA initial renewals, and the next generation scholarship, where initial or renewal students as well, which goes with GA. Um, at this point in time, we are unable to award uh, EA initials um, due to funding. Um, for funding purposes, we have awarded a total of one hundred and thirty eight million two hundred and ninety four thousand seven hundred and fifty five dollars uh, for a total of seventeen thousand and ninety two students of that um, one thousand nine hundred and sixty eight students uh, for a total of twenty one million five hundred eighty nine thousand four hundred have not uh, accepted their awards yet so we are still waiting for those individuals to accept their awards uh, those who have accepted their awards, a total of 15,124 students uh, for a total of 116,705,355. So based on uh, everything that went on with the budget, uh, originally we were allocated uh, 114 million. Uh, 20 million of that was taken away and replaced with the need-based fund. And then working with the governor's office, we were approved um, to for an additional 35 million from the need-based fund, which gives us 147 million, 240,000 dollars. So that's been our focus. Right now, we we have it budgeted up to that 147 million. Like I said, the 138 because we've had some students that fall have fallen off. So we always over award. At this point in time, because we know what the cancellation and decline rate is, we've awarded way over um, the allocated budget. But going on with the decline rate, we're down to that 138 million. So we'll make sure that we don't go over that 147 million um, as we keep awarding. And then as more students, if they decline or fall off, we'll keep awarding students. So currently, we have about 10 million that we'll focus on awarding this week. Uh, the focus will be first the GA renewals, 
uh, than the GA initials. We've been trying to fill in the GA initials as much as possible. And then we'll be looking at the EA renewals from there. But we're trying to make sure that all GA students are awarded first uh, before we move forward. Uh, we still have some institutions that are reporting credits. Um, at this point in time, we, we sent out last week a reminder uh, because it was supposed to end September 1st, the final deadline. We extended that due to the holiday and sent it out and we gave institutions till Friday. So at this point in time, recording credits is closed for renewal students. So any renewal students that have that are required because they received two years of payments based off legislation are required to complete 24 to 30 credits. If their spring 24 credits have not been reported, uh, those students have been deemed ineligible at this point in time so we can move forward with awarding students that are ready to be awarded and have everything in and, and source the money as much as possible. Uh, so that's where the status is with the EA program. Uh, questions, Matt? Thanks, Al, for the update. C can you give us a sense of what the queue looks like for how many GA, um, you know, initial awards are like pending if their funding became available? I think that's the biggest concern for some of our campuses. So we still do have a large amount. The federal government is still issuing ICERs out to us. So when we ran, when we were working with the governor's office and we ran our initial reports of all GA students that were anywhere on the wait list. Um, it came out to about 54 million. Uh, looking at the um, rate change or, or the acceptance rate, which is about 42% for EA and 80% for GA, uh, we looked at we would need really about 35 million to pay these students once we've awarded all of them. So we still have a large amount of uh, GA initial students that uh, we need to award and we're trying to just kind of tackle that on a regular basis uh, on a weekly basis so like i said as we have the 10 million available we'll go out and award last time i checked it was about 22 million um of students for ga initials that we needed to award so we awarded about six because that's all we had left last week now we have more funds so we'll look at awarding additional funds but there's about 22 million out there of GA initial students that still need to be awarded. Thanks, Alan. Just one quick follow-up. Is there any way to get just a quick summary of that in writing? Because it's hard to keep up with, you know, write down every single um, dollar figure you're mentioning in all the students. It's something we could send out to our campuses because I think the concern is, um, you know, at this point we're in midway through September and I know FAFSA ruined everything for everyone, but, you know, without having a GA, knowing they're having a GA, we have a lot of students that are not just not showing up on campus. And I just want to be able to give our institutions an update on where we are as of today, recognizing that that will change. Sure, sure. Um, I could send something out and, and if Debbie can share it with the um, commission, then um, I'll share it there. I'll give you what we've awarded so far, how many students actually are waiting. Uh, you know, the, the biggest piece is we do not know if we're going to have enough funds for these individuals, uh, again, we've pushed, we're hoping to, but the federal government keeps still releasing ICER data of individuals that were processed uh, by them prior to June 1st, um, but they just released it to us. And then the other piece is just with us extending it to June 1st, you have more individuals that are eligible for the funds. Uh, but really, I'm not sure that people were aware before, we've always continued to award throughout the year. So even though we had that hard deadline date, we always had students, whether they were selected for verification, there was an issue with their FAFSA, we always had students that met the requirements, but something stopped them from being processed. So we've always throughout the year gone and kept awarding GA students and even EA students when we had additional funds, but always GA students to make sure that we've awarded every student that was on the wait list. So, you know, I, I, I know it's an emergency and definitely is our priority, but I also feel like because it's something that's always been done, it's kind of the light has been shed on it, but we will still get students awarded. Uh, the biggest piece is we opened up the certification uh, I believe the last week of August, 
schools to go through and uh, with, with their certifications cancel any awards for students not being satisfied with academic progress or students who have not registered at this point in time is very key because then that will release more funds to award more students. Thank you, Al. And then just last follow-up, and it might be for the secretary, but does it does MHEC intend to seek a deficiency appropriation given the chairman's comments in the newspaper for additional GA funds? So uh, every student who had applied by June 1st and whose ICER data we had received by mid-August, I think mid-August or around that time, Al, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we have awarded pretty much all those students GA initials and GA renewals as well. Sometimes, you know, getting the credit information uh, or something you were delayed, uh, but all those students have been awarded. What Al is talking about now is the ICER data that is coming after that. So, and some of them are not ready to be awarded. As I understand, there are uh, gaps and other things. So we have to see uh, what's there, how many students are there, and then we will, um, you know, see what what is the best action at that point. So every student who applied by June first, whose ICER information was with us by mid mid August, Al or something, will yes, be August twentieth. August August twentieth. So mm -hmm. until August twentieth, every student who has applied by June first and whose ICER data M had received by August twentieth, all those students have been awarded. Right. And that is what we received additional appropriations through working with DBM and the governor's office for. So that's where I talked about the 114 million that we were originally allocated. Plus that and extra. We saw, yeah, we sought those 34 million uh, additional funds and we awarded. So uh, we still have some funds and we'll continue to award. Uh, but, uh, you know, at some point, uh, you, you know, uh, hopefully federal government will give us all the information and we will be in a better situation uh, so that it's not an un unending uh, process. Monica? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate what Matt said because um, it is a lot of data to kind of comprehend. So Al, and you might be going over this on uh, Thursday, or this might be a question for those who are in uh, more of the public policy arena, your researchers, but I was wondering if, um, first off, you said that there will be no new EA awards, correct? Is that correct. what's happening? Okay. Correct. So what, or and it, are you all going to look at the impact of our inability to provide new EA awards to families? Uh, I'm just very curious. Is that something that you know uh, MHEC will take a look at because you know that you know, we're we're talking about people here, and I was just wondering, um, looking at it from that perspective, and it might be like I said, something that your policy analysis and researchers will take a look at later on. But just curious if we're thinking about that as we're moving forward. Thank you. So, Barika, good suggestion. I mean, the students who are supported by EA, you know, we would certainly look at going forward. Uh, what should be the future? How those students should be funded? At this point, uh, GA remains our our uh, uh, priority, awarding as many GAs as possible. As I said. Every student, our priority deadline was May 15th, if you recall. But we went to June 1st. Every student who had applied by June 1st and whose ICER in data we received from federal government by August 20th, we have awarded all those students. So going forward, uh, certainly it's a question for us to determine how to provide access, how to provide financial support to students who, who need it most. Brad? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thanks for the update, Al. And I just want to reemphasize sort of the comments that Monica was making. I mean, effectively, what I'm hearing is there is no EA program anymore. Um, it's all GA. And for community college students, the GA, we may get 3% of that $116 million or less, 
we normally receive um, more students getting awarded EA grants, of which have dried up and got, are gone. This is a major problem for access and affordability for a particular segment of higher education that has some of the most uh, high need students enrolled. And this is sort of an untenable situation for a program to be in. And um, it probably does need some further look at going forward in the General Assembly. I know you all have um, JCR reports that talk about EA awards going to community colleges, but I think it's missing the force for the trees right now. This is a bigger issue for our students who will no longer be eligible or receive any state need based financial aid. So this is a major uh, repercussion of some of the policies that have happened with the GA, who, which is a, you know, I understand that it's a guaranteed grant and all awardees get awarded a GA and whatever is left receive an EA that there is nothing left. So we've got to look at how to fix this for um, access and affordability issues across the state. Yeah, I think Brad, uh, your point is very well taken. We have to generally think about uh, uh, financial uh, access um, and certainly the impact of EA, uh, particularly on community college students is something that as a higher education community, we need to think about and guaranteed access. You know, as you know, I'm new. <laughs> the word guarantee is kind of misleading. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's as long as the funds are available, right? So, so that is something uh, you know. Let, because funds are 114 million, or, or around that point. But uh, this year, because uh, the requirements have been changed, therefore there is about 37 percent increase in applications. I mean, 37 percent or around that that time, because this year GPA requirement was dropped. And uh, it used to be 2.5 GPA requirement. And also, students who graduated from high school for the last five years, Sal, you can correct me, they're also eligible for GA. So the, the applications for GA has, has increased. So again, that's an issue that all of us have to collectively see what is the best approach forward, knowing that, that funds are limited, right? We don't have unlimited access to funds. Given these funds, what is the best way to provide access to students who need it most, right? The other thing in the, in the context of community colleges, the promise is scholarship. Uh, we do want to see better utilization of promise scholarships. Al? Yeah, so just to add to that, Secretary, because you make very good points, uh, key discussion follow-up will be uh, as we go into FY26 uh, and institutions will be making GA awards, um, how institutions will go about awarding uh, their students uh, that are eligible uh, for the GA and, uh, you know, even the aspect between renewals and initials and then after GA, uh, what EA uh, funds are available or what funds are available for the EA award. So when we look at the aspect of October 1st, right around the corner, the federal government doing kind of a soft pilot uh, where the federal government has uh, sent out communication to colleges to participate or, or volunteer to participate in the pilot program for the FAFSA, kind of the initial outreach. Uh, and then the feds opening up the FAFSA again in December, that's their plan. Uh, we have a short around the time to really be prepared for new FAFSAs to come in and awarding to start occurring for fiscal 26 with the institutions doing the awarding of the EEA program, at least the GA portion of the EEA program. Any other question? Again, uh, thank you, uh, Matt, Brad, and Monica for those questions. They will help us. Uh, you know, kind of realign our programs to serve students in the best way possible and, and do what best we can do in terms of uh, uh, advocacy for these programs. Uh, let's move to the presentation from Maryland Department of Health and Upstream, uh, House Bill 477. Do we have our colleagues? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Good morning. Thank you. 
Hello all, my name is Becky Shasha Bennett and I'm the Women's Health Lead at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau at the Maryland Department of Health. And here today with our upstream colleagues, and we're gonna be talking about how we can support reproductive health on college and university campuses. So a little snapshot into the scope of the problem. So in Maryland, almost 300,000 women are in need of publicly funded contraceptive services and supplies. And about 42% of pregnancies are unintended in the state. Um, so this highlights the need for reproductive health services and access and colleges and universities are a place for people to get that. Um, so this fits into a high, into a larger um, strategy that we have at the health department. So we have the Women's Health Action Plan with six goals um, that highlight um, advancement for equity, choice, and access to health services in Maryland. And one of our key goals is protecting reproductive rights and expanding access to reproductive health services. And within that goal, uh, one of our priority initiatives is to provide technical assistance to colleges and universities to develop and implement the reproductive health services plans um, that were required by two recent um, pieces of le legislation. So I will start off with HB 477, and this applies to public senior higher education institutions. And this was enacted in 2023. Um, so by August 1st of this year, um, each university in consultation with students should develop and implement a reproductive health services plan to provide services at the institution, including re re referring students to a range of reproductive health services. Um, so this is an MHEC bill, but um, our, the Maryland Department of Health's role is to provide assistance in developing these plans. And some more detail about the requirements of the plan. So the institutions are required to provide or refer to, um, students to all methods of FDA approved contraception, prevention and treatment for STIs and abortion care services. In addition, providing 24 hour access to over the counter contraception, um, evidence based reproductive health services, and then also providing a referral network of reproductive health service providers uh, that students can access, including pharmacies. And then in 2024, um, HB 367 was enacted and this, this applies to community colleges. So by August 1st of next year, each community college in consultation with students should develop a plan to provide students with over-the-counter access to contraception. And again, um, the health department's role is to provide assistance um, and any referrals that you, the community colleges will need to be able to implement the plan. And some additional requirements of this plan for the over-the-counter access to re contraception should be through a student health center, retail establishments, vending machines, or any other method and community colleges would be required to report to MHEC starting next year on how students have been provided the access, how much contraception has been provided, and how collaboration with students and student organizations was implemented to, to help develop the plan. So um, how can we help you? Um, there are several things that we can, we can provide to help folks develop and implement their plans. One, we have the Maryland Family Planning Program, which is this um, Title X funded program, which provides contraception access, and we are in um, every jurisdiction of the state now. Um, we can help with mapping resources, so Title X clinics, health centers, abortion clinics, health systems, and primary care that provide reproductive health services. We can provide guidance on what the contra comprehensive contraception choices are that are approved by the FDA. We can help with um, sex ed programs, that would, be, that would be appropriate for um, the age level of the students. And then lastly, we can also help by um, helping you partner with Upstream, which provides technical assistance and training for free. And they are here to present a little bit on their services as well. 
So that was a lot of information. Um, this is our email address, reproductive.health at maryland.gov. And any institution that would like any assistance, um, referrals to services that, that are in, the, in their area, um, we can help provide that. So I will pass it over to Upstream, and then we can take um, questions for both presentations at the end. Great. Thanks, Becky. I will share my screen. Excuse me, just having technical difficulties. OK. Are you able to see? Great. I think you should be able to see that. Um, hi, everyone. I am Sarah Legride. I am the Senior Manager of State Initiatives at Upstream USA, and my colleague Seville and I will offer a really brief overview of our work and how we might be able to lend support in implementing reproductive health plans at your colleges and universities. So Upstream is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to ensure that patient-centered contraceptive care is basic health care. And we believe that patients should be able to access any birth control method they want um, wherever and whenever they seek their health care. So to achieve this vision, we work in partnership with health centers to strengthen reproductive care and autonomy by increasing equitable access to the full range of contraceptive options so that patients can decide if and when to get pregnant. And our program is designed and led by a team of experts. We work in close collaboration with our partners to deliver training and technical assistance tailored to meet a health center's particular contraceptive care goals. And Upstream is a well-resourced nonprofit, having secured significant philanthropic investments from large organizations such as uh, Blue Meridian Partners, Mackenzie Scott, and the Audacious Project from TED Talks. And because of the support that we've received, we are able to offer our services at no cost to our healthcare partners. So Upstream is um, partnering with the Maryland Department of Health to expand access to contraceptive care across the state. And we are really delighted to be a part of this collaboration, um, to work with the MDH team, and to be a part of Governor Moore's plan to expand reproductive health access in Maryland. And last year, in announcing the partnership, Governor Moore said, you know, this is about making sure that we treat contraception like basic health care, because contraception is basic health care. And we completely agree. And thus far, we have partnered with six community health centers and local health departments in Maryland. And because of our presence in the state and our work with the Department of Health, we wanted to um, come here and introduce ourselves as a resource and potential implementation partner um, in light of the legislation that Becky spoke to. So I will pass it to my colleague, Seville, to explain a little bit more about what our work actually entails. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good morning. Thanks again for having us. My name is Seville Melly, and I'm the Vice President of Practice Transformation at Upstream. Um, I'm just going to wrap up our presentation with two last slides uh, before we offer up some opportunity for questions. Um, so what I really want to ground us on um, in this space is really what high quality contraceptive care and access can look like. Uh, specifically for health centers that we partner with. Um, so when we think about patient care standards, we're really drawing from guidance and best practices established by prominent institutions, including the CDC, OPA, and ACOG, that reinforce uh, the work that we've been doing over the past 10 years across the country uh, to really develop patient care standards that we use to guide the support that we provide to the health center partners that we work so closely with. And so by supporting our partners in achieving these standards, we believe that we can help close some of these care gaps and address some of the inequities that we know exist in the reproductive healthcare field. And so together we work to raise the bar when it comes to delivering compre comprehensive patient-centered care. And so we use this term pretty frequently within a healthcare environment and really talking about what comprehensive patient-centered uh, contraceptive care can look like. And so I think it's really helpful to just define it to make sure we're all on the same page 
And so by this, what we mean is that at the highest level, individuals' uh, specific healthcare needs and desires uh, and their own health outcomes that they choose are really the driving force behind the care that they receive and the decisions that they make. And so it means that every patient who can become pregnant is routinely screened for their reproductive health needs uh, so that they can better uh, make choices alongside their providers. It means that if a patient is interested in preventing or delaying a pregnancy, that they're offered education, that they're offered counseling, so that uh, when patients guide the conversations around birth control alongside their providers, they're ending up with a method that is uh, better able to meet their desires and their needs and their uh, health outcomes. Um, it also means that we're focused on supporting uh, shared decision making. And so the patient is able to decide on the contraceptive plan that's best for them, uh, including choosing no method at all and really grounding what that patient desires at the forefront of the decision making process. And finally, uh, if a patient does choose a method, they're able to leave with that method, ideally on the same day that they request that method from their provider. Our approach is patient-centered and it aims to reduce the bias and coercion that we know can show up specifically in the reproductive health uh, space. And so we really want to ensure that our patients feel empowered to choose the options that work best for them. Next slide, Sarah. Uh, and so just in my last slide, this is a very high overview of what Upstream does in partnership with health centers uh, who we partner with. And so uh, overall Upstream's program is comprehensive, it's impactful, and it's designed around the needs of the healthcare organization, the providers that work there, and the patients that they serve. And so our program takes a tailored approach that respects the healthcare organization's time uh, it is primarily a virtual partnership. While we love to come and do a site visit and get to know our partners in person, really the majority of this work is being done via Zoom uh, and phone calls. Uh, our program supports sustainable practice change from the very beginning. We start our partners uh, with building sustainable best practices so that they can offer patient-centered contraceptive care long after our engagement with them ends. Typically, a programmatic partnership lasts about 12 months and includes the following. It includes a dedicated upstream team to project manage the practice transformation work alongside administration and providers at the health center. Uh, it includes a tailored implementation plan. And so we start every partnership with an assessment to really learn about the strengths and the opportunity to re reduce barriers in care for patients, and then we co-create an implementation plan alongside our partners. Uh, it includes technical assistance that ensures that sustainability of contraceptive services is at the forefront of the work that we do. We know that there's high turnover in staff, um, and so we really need to ensure that the work that we do now is uh, creates an ongoing and lasting impact for the patients that that health center is serving. Our work uh, also offers uh, continuing medical education credit, which is often a bonus because providers are required to be the, uh, maintain these credits all, already. Um, and it also supports access to measurement tools to really measure the practice change over time. Uh, it's one piece uh, of the body of work that we do to be able to really sustainably look at the work and measure and uh, see practice change, not just hear it from your patients and your providers, but actually see how it shows up in the data. Um, and then finally, we offer financial resources in the form of milestone payments. We know that taking some time away to work on practice change um, can uh, be a, res a resource drain, really. And so offering some financial resources to support the time that one needs to step away in order to do these improvements, uh, we find helps reduce some of the pain points through the change process. And we are happy to open it up to questions, uh, either for MDH or upstream at this point. 
to Secretary Rye if it's okay if I just jump in here real quick. So I just want to thank uh, Department of Health and our colleagues um, at Upstream for this presentation for uh, just as a reminder to recenter this. Uh, the public four years and the community colleges are now expected to be providing contraceptive access to, to contraception on the campuses in some way, shape or form for those uh, two pieces of legislation. We are bringing Department of Health and Upstream to you to get it to the campuses because they can provide the technical support to the campuses to do this work. Um, so I really just want to give a shout out to Department of Health um, for, for reaching out and letting us know that they are in collaboration with Upstream and that they can do this work. Uh, what is forthcoming is a formal memo on all of this so that you will have everybody's contact information. You will know how to reach out and follow up. Um, we'll clarify the reporting requirements um, that every public institution will need to have a plan. Um, so Brad, I saw your hand go down, so I think that was your question. Great, so that will go out to everybody uh, this week. Uh, I do have one question to Department of Health and our colleagues at Upstream. Uh, you do have uh, the private and independent institutions represented here. Are they able to, should they want to engage in this, even though they don't have to, should they want to engage in this initiative, uh, would you be able to provide support to them as well? Yes, we are happy to do anything that supports expanding reproductive health access in the state. So um, private institutions are welcome to contact us as well. Great. And um, does this also, I upstream, you talked about health centers. Even though a campus may, ha may not have an explicit health, se health center on the campus, can you still provide support to them in working with their local health department or other service or service providers? Yes, absolutely. Great. And now I'll see if there are any other questions. I predicted those would be some of the questions from, from our college representatives. Okay. With that, thank you, Department of Health and Upstream colleagues. Really appreciate you, you hopping on and, and providing this information. And again, segmental representatives, you'll get a memo later this week uh, outlining all of this information. Thank you. Secretary, I turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, now let's uh, hear from Civic Nation. Are our colleagues from Civic Nation here? Yes, good morning. Kyle, you're good on. Morning. Yeah, hey, everyone. Uh, Great to see you. My name is Kyle Learman. Uh, I'm the CEO at Civic Nation. I'll be very brief here. I'm I'm the Marylander on our team, so I just wanted to jump in and say hello. And Tracy Vitchers, who's the uh, remarkable executive executive director of our It's On Us uh, campaign to stop sexual assault on college campuses, is a Pennsylvanian, and Pennsylvania is doing way more on this issue. So when I found that out, I said, Emily, we got to get going on this uh, in the great state of Maryland. Um, so just. Uh, thrilled to be with you all today. Emily, Secretary, thanks for having us. And I'll turn it over to Tracy. Tracy, jump in. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle and Emily. Thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. It's great to meet with all of you. Um, as Kyle mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of It's On Us. Um, for those who might not be as familiar with It's On Us, we were originally founded in 2014 as a public awareness campaign of the Obama-Biden administration. And today, 10 years later, uh, we are leading the movement to combat campus sexual assault um, by giving students, and, and especially young men, the tools to address the cultural norms at the, room of, at the root of sexual harm. Um, and we do this in a variety of ways that I'm going to talk through. Um, but by and large, it, most of the work runs through currently our student organizing program. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, we have had over 450,000 folks take our It's On Us pledge, our student chat, we have more than 340 student chapters, we've engaged over 500 college campuses, and our students have held more than 15,000 educational programs all across the country. Um, and at It's On Us, we really focus on primary prevention in order to stop violence on sexual, to stop sexual violence on campus before it happens. Um, and I'm going to talk through the ways that we do that. Um, so first and foremost, we have our campus organizing program, which is essentially a peer education program. So we can establish chapters with students 
there are a variety of ways on college campuses. First and foremost, there is just direct student support. Students come to us, they want to start a Nets on Us chapter and get trained as peer educators. We will work with them directly to do that. Um, in other cases, we work through student government associations, SGAs, where the It's on Us chapter is a formal function of their SGA, or we also work through Title IX or sexual violence prevention offices. Um, so partnering with Title IX officers to identify students who want to become It's on Us peer educators, and we provide them with the training to do so. Um, we offer an It's On Us peer educator certification program. So students who are part of our It's On Us chapters are expected to complete all four of the programs in our prevention education suite. That is Prevention 101, Dating Violence Prevention, Bystander Intervention, and Social Norms. They are expected to complete at least two in the Prevention Strategist Program, which goes a little bit deeper and addresses issues such as engaging men or technology and online safety. Um, and then they are expected to do uh, our at least one program in our Prevention Expert uh, Suite, which is anything from community level prevention to breaking cycles of violence. Um, and students are expected to complete at least two of these programs every semester as part of their It's On Us journey. Um, our campus chapters are also expected to register their peer education events with us so that way we can see what kind of work that they're doing um, and sometimes it is directly taking these programs and applying them with members of their campus community in other cases it's taking lessons from these programs and applying them in other ways so for example with our dating violence prevention programs we talk about the nine signs of an abusive relationship the students will then have a nine signs movie screening where they have little red flags and they pick a movie like Twilight and they talk about the nine signs at the start of the movie and every time Edward Cullen does something that is one of the nine signs of an abusive relationship, the students wave their little red flags, they pause the movie and they talk about which of the nine signs it was. Um, our students have really done incredible work over the last 10 years with these prevention education programs and are really driving that change and that conversation within their campus communities. Um, the way that we train our students is either virtually or um, we host regional summits. I wanted to call out that we host four regional summits a year. Um, and we actually have an upcoming summit uh, at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC on Saturday, September 28th. And Emily, I can share the link to register that with you um, for any folks who might wanna send students. Um, I'm really excited. We're gonna have uh, Adako Onyika Crawford, who's a senior counsel for the Office for Civil Rights um, at the US Department of Education as a keynote speaker coming up at the summit to talk about the new Title IX rule. Um, and I'm very, very excited for her to be there and to meet with our students just to talk about what's going on with Title IX across the country since the new piece uh, of uh, law went into place August 1st. Um, but those regional summits are really a great opportunity for our students to come together, meet students from other college campuses, and, and network and build some of these really critical peer education skills. Um, we also, this past year, rolled out for the first time what is called our Playbook on Sexual Assault Prevention and Healthy Relationships for Male Student Athletes. Um, over the last two years, we've invested quite a bit of resources in, in conducting research with college men about their attitudes and behaviors as it relates to campus sexual assault and its prevention. And one of the outcomes of that research is our Playbook. Um, and we specifically partner with university athletic departments to implement the Playbook Kyle Richard, who is our head of men's engagement, who's featured here in this photo, leads this work. Um, and it includes five programs um, focused on key topics for sexual assault prevention that meet campus save as well as NCAA attestation requirements for prevention education. Each of the programs are no more than 45 minutes in length, um, and they're intended to be conducted in multiple doses throughout the school year uh, within an individual team environment. And I can also have Emily share the information on the playbook with all of you as, as part of our follow up from this conversation. Um, but we have seen a lot of success working with athletic departments on the playbook and being able to have conversations with male athletes is, has been really, really incredible for our team. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, uh, we have a very unique relationship with Pennsylvania um, that we wanted to share with all of you um, here today. Um, in 2016, Governor Tom Wolf of Pennsylvania declared Pennsylvania the first it's on us state. 
And since that time, we've had the opportunity to invest in doing some really incredible work within the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so there are two sort of functions of this IOUPA program that I'll talk about briefly. We have our grant program. Um, so since 2016, more than 300 grants um, totaling nearly almost $9 million have been given to 100 colleges and universities across the state in Pennsylvania. This funding um, was passed as part of the Pennsylvania Department of Education spending budget every year. Um, it is a competitive grant application process that is managed by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, every year, we've actually increased the amount of funding available. So now it is more than a million dollars annually that is given in grants to schools all across Pennsylvania to do this work. Um, and schools can apply for grants that range anywhere from $10,000 to $60,000 and they can be used for the expansion of prevention programs or to conduct campus climate surveys in order to then design prevention efforts that meet the meet the needs of that campus community. Um, we have seen incredible success with this grants program. We know that in a lot of cases, prevention education on college campuses is underfunded, um, or there might be like one or two people on a campus responsible for doing prevention education. And this funding has really bolstered the prevention education uh, outcomes for schools across the state of Pennsylvania over the last eight years. Um, we've also worked with uh, legislators uh, in Pennsylvania's uh, state house um, and state senate to pass bipartisan legislation under the banner of It's On Us Pennsylvania. Um, for example, we were able to work uh, to enact a yes means yes consent bill, um, another law that requires at least one in-person prevention education program per year for all enrolled students, online porting, uh, online reporting options for students who experience sexual violence, um, and then also to share better information with students about what their rights are if they've experienced sexual assault as part of that reporting process. Process. Um, and now we are also expanding some of the work to K to 12. Um, and there is now a bill in place uh, that requires schools to teach consent and, and uh, healthy relationships in high school curriculum through It's On Us Pennsylvania. So it has really been a whole grassroots, uh, grass tops approach in Pennsylvania to be able to provide this funding to pass legislation that strengthens prevention education and supportive uh, processes in the state. And it has just been incredibly successful. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, you know, the competition between Pennsylvania and Maryland is very real. Um, and we would love to explore ways with the Higher Education Commission how to bring more of It's On Us's work to the state of Maryland and potentially have an opportunity to do It's On Us Maryland uh, in the future. Um, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. So I will make sure that Emily, you get all of this information via email afterwards. Um, but I do wanna make sure that we're able to answer any questions that you all might have. And Kyle, is there anything that you wanna add? No, I think we can jump into questions. Great, thank you. So I think the big to do, um, would be to encourage campuses to think about creating an It's On Us chapter. Um, and again, another memo will go out with all of this great information, contacts for you all to share with the campuses um, as we think about addressing uh, sexual violence and sexual education uh, collectively. So I'll add th those two comments and then see if there are any other questions from, from the segmental group. And Emily, I was just going to say, the campus chapter students, great opportunity for folks to come to Catholic um, at, on September 28th. And then second, if um, Tracy and Kyle and her team are eager and willing to talk to any of your athletic departments as well. So encourage you to, to take them up on that. Um, and and then more broadly, longer conversation. But um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to build a, a movement to drive It's On Us Maryland forward. And so excited to start that conversation with you all today. Thank you, uh, Kyle and uh, Tracy, uh, for your offer uh, for support. Uh, you know, I have not noticed any competition with, with Pennsylvania, but uh, that's fine. Oh man! <laughs> so, so uh, uh, no, I, I, I'm sure uh, we all this competition is in healthy spirits, and uh, we want to learn from Pennsylvania, and and maybe they can learn a few things from us too. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, I want to encourage all my colleagues to take full advantage of this this opportunity. And Dr. Dow will send you all the details 
very important topic and, and I think uh, this is an area where we do want to provide as much support as, as possible. So thank you again. Thank now you. for rest of uh, for rest of the meeting, we have some really very important items and we will go through them uh, rather uh, quickly, uh, but uh, they are nothing new. We have been talking about these uh, for the last several months. So Dr. Dow, the rest of the agenda is pretty much yours. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna run through uh, a number of updates. Uh, some of this is just information sharing. Some of this is open for discussion and some of this is to think about our next steps and what we need to do as an agency to move this along. So first, um, an update on the Moore Miller state plan. Uh, we have been working with the governor's office on three key performance indicators. This is, these indicators are the ones uh, highlighted at the bottom of the screen. Uh, percent of students receiving the Community College Promise Scholarship, percent of students receiving any state financial assistance award, and four-year transfer and graduation rates of first-time community college students. These are the, gonna be the public-facing key performance indicators. Now we recognize that this does not fully encapsulate all of the great work that happens in higher education in Maryland. Um, so we are working with, uh, again, the governor's office to identify some additional indicators. We will likely be coming to you um, in future meetings to discuss those indicators and think through them. Um, let me give you some, some, um, some foreshadowing of that. Um, dual enrollment is something that there has been increased attention on, particularly dual enrollment that is intentional. Um, so we're talking about those early middle college or early access programs, particularly those that uh, are STEM oriented or career oriented. So we're in the early stages of seeing what that looks like in collaboration with MSDE, um, but dual enrollment is, uh, is a key focus. And then we'll pick up on this in a minute, um, a general focus in STEM fields broadly in higher education. Um, and so those are some um, spaces that we're continuing to have conversations uh, with the governor's office when it comes to the, the data that we will use to identify our progress and setting some goals. But in the meantime, I just wanted to make you all aware, these are the three public facing ones and more indicators are on the way questions on more Miller state plan, you'll likely start to see some dashboards uh, from the governor's office on the implementation of the more Miller state plan, along with indicators from all sorts of other state agencies. You see the other ones listed here for MSDE, um, Department of Labor has a number, Commerce has a number, uh, uh, environment, health, transportation, and the like. I'll move on. Pending no questions, comments, concerns. Okay. Post-2025 draft goals. As you all know, we've been working uh, over the summer. Uh, this really started last spring to think through what our new, uh, new goals will be after 2025. Uh, we've been working closely with HCM strategists um, through the Lumina Foundation to help us think through our data, think through uh, what other states are doing and uh, have been working with our commissioners through the Education Policy Committee um, to have further discussions about what these new goals look like. At this point, this is a summary of where we are moving, what the direction looks like. So a new attainment goal where we are 65% of Marylanders aged 25 to 64 will have a certificate or degree by 2030. Um, this is based off of our Stronger Nation report that comes out of the Lumina Foundation. If you look at that, th those data, uh, we're at about 58% in Maryland, um, and that is for 2023 um, data. Uh, so it 65% seems like a, a good push, a good challenge for us um, to be working towards. On top of that, we've expanded what this looks like by incorporating equity, credentials of value, and research. Um, so a commitment to eliminating post-secondary attainment gaps. 
Many other states have elements around uh, attainment gaps, completion gaps, particularly by race and ethnicity. Um, so making a, a blanket statement that we are committed to eliminating the post-secondary attainment gaps gives us the avenue and space to um, further that, that initiative. Third, um, thinking through specific uh, credentials of value and specific uh, completion goals, uh, different than an attainment goal. Um, based on the data that we have uh, currently, we typically produce about 85,000 students with, with uh, some kind of credential, undergrad cr credential. We incorporate um, our non-credit credentials from the community colleges. This 90 to 100,000 um, seems like that's in range for us to do that annually. Um, Allison, I see your hand. Let me get through the rest and then bump over to you. Uh, last is uh, a focus on research and innovation and particularly goals that are aligned with Maryland's economic strengths, strategic vision, and workforce sectors. As we dive in, in particular, to our uh, research-oriented institutions, particularly at the public, uh, in the public space, we can see through the MFR and the PAR metrics that uh, our research institutions really have existing goals. So instead of establishing new goals, we might be working with those institutions to refresh those goals. Uh, think about them as they are aligned with uh, Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, and other uh, strategic initiatives that are coming from the governor's office. Um, but again, giving that space that we recognize uh, that our colleges and universities not only educate, but they create new knowledge, they create new products, um, they create the world of tomorrow in many ways and, and give recognition to that work. So that's what we're looking at for the post-2025 uh, draft goals. I can go through the next steps, but let me pop over to Allison for questions. Thanks. Just a quick question on the attainment goal, which again, we're, we're supportive of raising the attainment goal and adding um, certificates, but we want to ho hopefully we'll be clear on the importance of degrees and we still track uh, and measure ourselves in degree attainment because the research still tells us that a degree is the uh, still the coin of the realm, so to say. So, um, so hopefully there's a piece of that in your plan. Absolutely. Secretary. So, yeah. Can I just uh, provide a context? So, just to refresh our memories, uh, uh, we did a survey, and we discussed the survey a couple of times at these meetings, where we provided what other states are doing especially states that are highlighted, you know, are making a lot of progress in, in these areas. And we put that as, as part of the survey and ask institutions to provide their input. And from that, these recommendations have emerged. And we have discussed this at least in a in, in couple of meetings uh, prior to this. So when we brought the survey to all our institutions, we analyzed our 2025 goals that were set in 2013 and at that time it was associate degree or higher that's it right so you know a lot of a lot of things have changed now and other states are looking at, at you know certificates certain certificates not not all i guess but um, so if you look at our goals from our presentations at least uh, in our previous meetings uh, that 55 percent goals we are we are counting only associate degrees or higher uh, we will get to 53% or, or somewhere there by 2025. So we get close. I give kudos to our higher education uh, institutions that they produce significantly more graduates that, than what they were expected to in reaching uh, these goals, in spite of uh, you know enrollment decline. But as a state, we are not reaching because there are other things that are happening people leaving the state and people coming in, right? That's where uh, this went. And the other thing is the equity gaps in the data, as you saw from those presentations, is significant, significant. So those are the things, you know, equity and economic competitiveness is something we are very interested in. So the certificates are important, 
but in population attainment goals, associate degrees and higher are there. But we're just adding some other things. So Lumina added some, some other certificates. By adding those certificates, we are at 58.3%. So I think, uh, you, you know, I don't know how many other states are, are ahead of us, but uh, we are in a reasonably good position. So again, uh, institutions, especially community colleges, those certificates, majority of them are coming uh, from community colleges. And look, we go from 53% to 58.5%. So, you know, a little bit more focus there and our associate degrees and higher, we can get to 65% uh, in, in my opinion. Thank you. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, just, I know I've mentioned this in the other meetings, but I think if there's one thing we learned with the 55% was to your point that the you know, denominator always makes it difficult um, in Maryland. And so, you know, building on Allison's point, if we can have degrees awarded as part of that, it would be very helpful because the institutions could be doing everything they possibly could do to meet the goal, but we could still wind up exactly where we were uh, with the 55% goal, with the 65% goal. And I get that Lumina likes the 65% goal, but I think, you know, in fairness to the institutions, we have to make sure that we're monitoring that as well and giving credit where credit to. Good, good points. And again, just to make it very clear, 65% doesn't come from Lumina. This is something that we are looking at other states and we are proposing. If you want to change it to 68%, 70% is fine. But I think that, that uh, you know, even with 65%, 35% of our population will not have a certificate or a credential. So, you know, our economic competitiveness where 35% of the population cannot access the economic opportunity, that is concerning, right? So that's why the population goal and within that the equity goal is very important. Certainly, as I said today, uh, you know, our institutions have produced more graduates. So that data will always be there for us, Brett. No, thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is the first time I've kind of seen sort of all of this coming together in a slide with a 65% goal and including other credentials outside of associate's degree and a bachelor's degree, which I do think provide economic opportunity and mobility for people that otherwise have not received it. And the state does invest in it. So it should be measured and should be realized for that goal. And, um, you know, if we're at 58.3 now, 65%, I think we almost got there with an annual increase of about three every year i think this is a doable goal and it incorporates a lot of things that we're doing in a way that the pre-2025 goals did not so um anxious to see a little bit more of your details emily as you go through the presentation and i think uh, you know we also have opportunity to to get further input remember at every meeting we're asking for more input and every time I go to campuses and I ask leaders, have you heard about this survey that we are doing? Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. So make sure that this is shared with your chief academic officers, chief student affairs officers. It's not just stuck at the highest level uh, of the leadership. The other part I will say with our 2025 goals, higher education did perfect, but we are not meeting the goal. Equity gaps are serious. But look at shortage of teachers, shortage of nurses, cybersecurity jobs that are open, cloud computing jobs that are open, and the emerging areas, you know, economy is going to change. So research and innovation is our strength in the state of Maryland. Many of our institutions are national leaders. Our cabinet just visited the University of Maryland uh, last week. And what we learned, and we are so fascinated, I am so fascinated about the work uh, that's happening over there. World's 80% of the quantum computing power is on our University of Maryland campus. Imagine the economy and products and all that that will come up. So we can't fall behind in, in, in creating homegrown talent in, in, in those, those areas. So, you know, our universities are, are leaders. And what we have to think about, how do we make sure that our tax base increases, more jobs are created, and everyone in our state, every resident of our state has access to jobs that are in demand now, 
but also in the emerging areas of our economy. So when we think about these goals, we have to be futuristic. Dr. Dow, I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> no, thank you, Secretary. Uh, I appreciate everyone's comments. Um, so duly noted in terms of um, content and, and where to go. So let me just give you some highlights of next steps. Um, we are going to move pretty quickly on, on some of this work uh, in the next six to eight weeks. Uh, first, uh, you will be, you're going to be getting a ton of information at the end of today's meeting. So let me just preface all of that. Um, so you all will be getting a briefing document or we're going to circulate a briefing document that won't be directed to any one organization. It will be used very broadly to provide an overview of where we are, the data sources, how we got to this point, some other comparisons with other states. So a, a briefing document with uh, that draft language. Um, we are going to put out a survey, in which case you will get a memo for that. Um, and we do encourage not only you as segment leaders, uh, but certainly the colleges and universities uh, to complete that survey. And we'll just be a, a few basic questions. What do you think? Does this work? Do you not like it? Recommendations for changes, um, things to consider. So just giving uh, the public a, a, an interface to communicate with us outside of just a traditional email. Um, so we will ask for responses to be due October 13th. So again, kind of a, a bit of a quick turnaround. The Education Policy Committee of our commissioners will meet the week of October 13th. The commission will also discuss it at the October 23rd meeting. And as we have been targeting, our goal is to announce these new goals uh, at the Student Success Summit in November. This, um, we've already laid some foundation that this will require legislative changes. So there will be a bill that uh, we plan to put forward uh, for the next legislative session. Um, so we're also trying to be thoughtful about the language we use as well. Questions on post-2025 goals and where we are and next steps. Okay, with that, I'm gonna move on to our Student Success Summit and our agenda. Uh, we have a working title for, for, the, for the event, Harnessing Maryland's Potential Through Student Success. Um, the, our commissioners and Secretary Rai think it's very important that we continue to center students um, in all of our conversations. So that's why this is a student success summit. Um, as we've been saying, the Thursday evening is our presidents and board chairs. Um, and Friday, here's a bit of a, a synopsis of what to expect. So bear with me, I'm going to read it verbatim. Uh, the day will feature national speakers and offer dedicated discussion time for campus space and inter-campus colleagues. Attendees will learn about the post-2025 goals and they will begin, I just wanna be clear, it's a start, <laughs> start reflecting on updating their institutional strategic plans to align with these new state objectives. The day will include sessions on identifying opportunities and challenges and will highlight successes from other states to provide insights and inspiration. This will be the first of several other convenings that we will do over the next 12 to 18 months. And in many ways, setting these goals will set the stage for our next iteration of the state plan. Um, so unlike uh, in past iterations of the state plan, we want this to be a much more iterative process with the campuses. Um, so that it's not, okay, we have goals, we have state plan, campuses, now you do a thing. Instead, approaching the campuses right here, right now at the start of the goals, we can write a state plan that reflects the, the um, potential that our campuses have um, in a way that, that moves the needle forward uh, around a variety of student success initiatives. Um, so that is uh, a bit of the update of the agenda and what we're looking at. Uh, again, uh, really important that I, I wanna emphasize that there will be explicit time uh, to reflect, uh, think through institutional strategic plans, talk with colleagues. Uh, so it'll be a very interactive day. Um, let me give you some attendance updates. We do have 17 institutions who have RSVP'd in some way, shape, or form. Um, so we will be uh, sending out email reminders to everyone to say who we have and have not heard from. Um, and we want to be very clear, and we'll put this in the communication, that we do have a bit of a targeted attendance for Friday. 
certainly we want the president, um, absolutely the, the chief academic officer, the provost, um, with an opportunity for student services, depending on where they live in the institutional structure, chief financial officer, including at people from financial aid, um, and the chief technology officer as well, um, just knowing how we're outlining the agenda. Uh, day two is that Friday is still limited to five folks um, just because of space capacity. Um, so just being thoughtful about who comes. With that, let me turn it over. I think Matt was first and then Allison. Thanks, Emily. Just a couple of questions. I'll give them all to you once and then you can work right. through. One is on the Thursday night meeting. Obviously, um, it, it seems like a great idea to get you know presidents and board chairs there. We have a lot of um, some institutions with out-of-state board chairs. So if you can elaborate a little bit on what that evening looks like, if it's just a social engagement or if there's other things. Then secondly, um, when you're talking about the state plan in this instance, you're talking about the state plan for higher education, correct? Not the more Miller state plan. And that's due January 1st, is that correct? Jan uh, July 1, 2026. Okay, okay, great. Um, that's helpful. And then lastly, can you just remind um, us which outside organizations will be involved on Friday, um, sort of providing data information and, and challenges? Absolutely. I'm going to have to rattle them off off the top of my head. Um, so here we go. Uh, Lumina, Aspen, Achieving the Dream, and there are two more that I am blanking on. I think Complete College America Complete. may be one. Yep. And, uh, Maybe education is a strategy group, uh, yes. or something like that. I yeah. I think they're on the short list as well. Yeah. And so you know that is still being finalized. So. Yep. But um, what I can do, that if that's helpful, I can put that in our email communication that we have been, we plan to invite. We've invited, um, you know, national speakers. I will say this will be probably the only time that we do national speakers at. Uh, at uh, future convenings, we will focus more about our state and what's happening here in Maryland. So this is the, the start of a kind of a national perspective, and then we'll narrow into Maryland specifically at future convenings. Did I Sorry. get all your questions, Matt? Uh, just the Thursday night. Um, oh, again. yes. So that will be an opportunity. We really have never uh, had all the presidents um, in a room together. And uh, we recognize that board chairs often hold presidents accountable. So it's just helpful to have the board chairs hear a president only discussion. Um, so if a board chair can't make it, we can try to see if we can do some virtual options um, if they are out of state. Uh, so we can talk offline and see how we can accommodate that. Thanks, and then just one quick follow-up. So it is it is designed to be discussion, not just a, a dinner, is it designed yes. to be a interactive discussion about higher education in Maryland? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. And dinner, <laughs> but yes, definitely a substantive discussion for about an hour and a half uh, before dinner. Allison. So could you clarify for me on the statement on the previous slide where you're going to expect institutions to update their own institutional strategic plans to align with these new state objectives. Universities have strategic plans in place in various places. Some might be a year old, some might be ready to revise. Are you expecting every university in the state to go back in and revise its, and it's actually its middle states probably required strategic plan? Right, right. No, not in any immediate sense. But thinking through what can we do in the immediate, um, I do know that in the next four years, we have a number of institutions that are up for, for at, the, at the public level. Matt, I don't know about yours. Um, so, um, so thinking through that, yeah, we, I, 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 we have no expectation that strategic okay. plans will be updated in 2025 or 2026. But if they're gonna be updated in 2027 or in 2028, Let's start thinking about what that looks like and in light of these new uh, statewide initiatives. And I uh, personally read uh, many strategic plans and uh, 
almost all of them have elements of these these goals so maybe uh, you know within the existing plans uh, just a little bit more focus uh, on that because plans seem at least what we see is is quite general what's available on the public side so there's a probably opportunity to provide more focus uh, within the existing plans without you know changing the whole thing and again, just an emphasis, this is just to start reflecting on it um, and giving some space to, to think about that. Okay, any other questions about the Student Success Summit? Okay, so an email will be going out on this as a reminder and encouraging campuses as segmental leaders. Um, if you can, please do it. You, you need to, to um, make sure we have campus representation from your and Matt is and Matt is winning, and I think it will be hard. It will be good to give him some competition. <laughs> we we do as much as we love the Mickey Wood president. <laughs> it'd be great to have uh, some additional additional folks in representation. Okay, moving on. STEM definition. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the governor's uh, the more Miller administration has. Um, really honed in on STEM initiatives, both in terms of STEM education as well as STEM workforce. As we think through uh, not only key performance indicators and the, the data that can come along with that, but targeted initiatives, we do need to think through a STEM definition. And uh, this has been something we've uh, done some research on, and as many of you probably know, there's no federal standard um, for a STEM definition. Um, other states have um, struggled with defining STEM, particularly STEM as an interdisciplinary field, and then STEM as the traditional standalone science, technology, engineering, and math. At this point, um, so you'll see on the slide, uh, you know, we recognize that Department of Homeland Security um, has some definitions for the purposes of student visas. Um, there's also an NSF uh, scholarship that uh, is for teachers in particular STEM fields um, and has a, has a kind of working list of eligible programs. At this point, when, when I just want to say out loud, so this is just information sharing and then open for discussion. At this point, when we, if we are to, if MHEC is to issue anything around STEM, we will likely limit the analysis to these SIP codes and these HEGIS codes. Um, this, uh, the SIP codes are typically what is recognized by Department of Homeland Security along with um, NSF uh, initiatives. And the HEGIS codes have been the traditional uh, codes, but uh, I recognize, Brad, they, these don't necessarily fit for the community colleges, which is why we need to bump over to SIP codes. Um, and I just wanna say explicitly that uh, the general by and large consensus is that STEM does not include social sciences. It does not include the health sciences or professions, agriculture, business, or education. So I wanted to just say those things out loud, um, let you know that we will likely be producing some reports around STEM and broadly using these as our boundaries to define STEM when we're talking about specific academic programs. Now let me open that up for discussion and feedback. <laughs> Brad. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have my SIP and he just codes all memorized and how they crosswalk, but my first question Let's say, for example, the National Governors Association would consider nursing as a STEM field. How would that lay out and how would that fall into uh, these categories? So as of right now, there is not an appetite to include nursing um, because it, it's, it's considered more of a health profession than necessarily um, a science and scholarship. So. That's why I want to be clear, we would not include nursing in this definition. And so if we put out any reports, we'd footnote all of that. Um, oh, yeah, so I'll stop there. Any other thoughts, questions on a working definition of STEM as we think through initiatives, data, and the like?
Okay. Think on this. <laughs> if you have major concerns um, as we move ahead, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, this is not to say that we can't make a more flexible definition, but this is our starting point, and this is where we'll, we'll what we'll work with for now. Uh, Phyllis. I'm sorry, Dr. Dow, right after you said are there any other questions, but I see under the SIP codes, we have mathematics and statistics is listed there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know you said does not include social sciences or business, but then there may be stats classes in those areas. So they are not included because they're, is that what you're saying? So it's by program, not necessarily course. By program, not by course. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So these would be program codes uh, that we would use to categorize graduates. Allison. Yeah, and I would say, Phyllis, um, the STEM OTP, OPT extension from the Department of Homeland Security is always a great place to look. <laughs> yep. um, because students are very concerned about being able to stay for that. So uh, that, that always is a, a great place to look to see if your programs are going to have that STEM uh, that your international students want. <laughs> but the STEM OPT, I, I know we use the STEM OPT for um, some business courses for example, yep. that are somewhat statistical in nature and things like yep. that. So that's why it's kind yeah, of a I, question. Yeah. On that one, uh, somebody who is a beneficiary of OPT program, um, me, <laughs> in our days it was one year. So now, as you know, if your STEM is three years, and I think they go by what your institution says also, because I know several institutions and you know accounting profession is becoming more stem because of you know all the data cyber security and other things so uh, you know some accounting graduates also are counted but as dr dow said this is just the starting right. thank you secretary <laughs> we are grateful for the uh, opt extension <laughs> opportunity okay so uh, again, just wanted to say these things out loud. If um, as we progress on STEM uh, topics, please uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. This is uh, similarly just a little nudge and a reminder to everybody. Uh, we issued out a memo uh, back in June after the presentation around the IUSE and the STEM grant opportunities. Um, Secretary Rai has uh, has set a a loose goal in the uh, space of goals, uh, that every college and university in Maryland apply for at least one grant opportunity within the next uh, two years. Um, so please continue to push that with your campuses. We will be checking uh, the data come next spring to see who has applied, um, who's been awarded. We really do want Maryland to be the forefront uh, of these opportunities and they're, they're really great resources. So again, you know, I can't appreciate this um... Uh, more. <clears throat> Remember, we had a presentation from uh, two of the recent uh, awardees from SSTEM and IU's program at one of our segmental meetings. Uh, we talked about the scholarship for financial need students. SSTEM is a scholarship for STEM. The National Science Foundation can give you up to 2.5, 2.8 million dollars for all low-income eligible students to pretty much get 100% of their scholarship, in, depending on where they are, they are studying. So I think this is a great opportunity. Federal government has, has funds, and these funds come from H-1B visa fees, right? So H-1B workers come from other parts of this world. So this is our opportunity to create those, those workers right here at home. I use it in improvement in undergraduate science education. That talks about pedagogy. How do you make sure that more first generation students, students of color, are successful in these programs? What kind of wraparound services they need? And it comes with national best practices. What kind of inclusive pedagogies is needed? Understanding who is in the classroom and how do we uh, provide instruction to those students. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I would like to see every institution apply. And these are not extremely competitive. These are not. I mean, in my own previous experience, uh, you know, we I saw that we were successful. Um, the other uh, aspect of this is, uh, uh, you know, two years, 
each year there are two different cycles you can apply twice in a year so you know there are lots of opportunities and please make sure that uh, your provost and your deans of stem areas are aware of these opportunities and if it is helpful we can do a half day summit where we invite uh, PIs from our own institutions. Morgan State University has some, several actually, uh, these programs. University of Maryland has, and others, UMBC and others have that too. So we can bring our own expertise and provide help and guidance and make sure that our students all get, also get this fair share of scholarships uh, from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Okay, so speaking of academic programs and categorizing them, whether it's STEM um, or otherwise, uh, let me remind everybody that we have the Cybersecurity Public Service Scholarship. Um, uh, we have a working list of eligible academic programs. Um, You'll get these slides, you'll have these links, um, but we need to update the list and give campuses an opportunity to refresh if there's a particular program. So this is simple. Just know that there's a memo forthcoming to send out to the campuses. We'd like to hear back from the campuses on November 1st um, if a particular program needs to be added to the list. Um, this is a pretty robust uh, scholarship and great opportunity uh, when it comes to cybersecurity initiatives. Next up. We have, oh, yep, go ahead, Brad. Sorry, I didn't ask if there were questions. No, just really quickly, how much money is in the Cybersecurity Public Service oh. Scholarship? Great question. I do not know that off the top of my head. Um, okay. I'll I don't know if any of my MHEC colleagues would know that. I'm sorry, I don't know that. That's okay. I have a budget book. I'll look it up right here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I don't know that. Um. Okay. We have many, many of these scholarships we are not fully utilizing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the point. So, so we want and we want to Am I back? I'm back. <laughs> we want to make sure that every academic program that can be on this list is on this list. I will say out loud, we do not include programs that have areas of concentration in cybersecurity. Uh, just simply because sometimes those cybersecurity concentrations really only amount to two or three classes. Um, so we want dedicated programs in cybersecurity uh, or the like. Okay. We um, have a couple of mechanisms within academic affairs to identify academic programs where students are going out of state. And those two mechanisms are our academic common market where students can attend uh, another state within the southern region area um, at an in-state tuition rate if the program is not held, uh, not offered uh, at a Maryland institution. So we have a whole, students can apply through our agency, we validate whether or not they can go out of state and we compare them to our existing programs. Similarly, students can take a legislative scholarship out of state if that program is not offered in Maryland, so the delegate and senatorial scholarship. So we see now are tracking this uh, in better form to identify programs of study uh, in which we are seeing students leave the state for. Um, so you're gonna get a memo on this, but I wanted to just say this out loud. Here's the quick summary of the academic programs. Sports management, sports industry related programs seem to be a constant over the past five, 10 years or so. Um, we've seen a few programs pop up, um, but that is a, a key, key space where we are lacking some specificity. Um, intelligence and security studies, um, cardiovascular technology at the bachelor's level, um, horse um, science, uh, you'll see, so I won't read all the rest of them, but you'll get a memo, um, some specific programs as well um, in which we're sending to a specific institution so the campuses can look up that curriculum and try to see if there's a way to um, leverage an existing program to stop sending students out of state. So more to come, but I uh, wanted, again, to let you know that this memo is forthcoming. Questions on this? 
again, you know, I want to make sure that uh, this goes to the right individuals on your campuses, especially your academic affairs folks, presidents certainly, and uh, to see, you know, we want to keep our students here, but we also want to keep all the scholarships here because we, talk, we were talking about EA, GA earlier. You know, why are we sending our resources out of the state? Optometry, I mean, I mean, we have no optometry program in the state of Maryland. Uh, you know, we have outstanding uh, schools, uh, including in ophthalmology and other areas. So we may not be that that far. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, all these areas think about, uh, you know, when we think about academic program, uh, let's step outside what is already offered here. We spend a lot of time in creating those programs, but let's think about where we have no programs. How do we create programs in those areas? Great. Thank you. Um, on to the next topic: our post-secondary employment uh, post-secondary employment outcomes um, opportunity with census PSEO. Uh, how can I say this succinctly? <laughs> so census has been convening states and allowing states to share uh, their post-secondary data so that states, uh, and in particular specific institutions, better understand uh, where students go and in what industry when they cross state lines. As many of you know, we have MLDS here in Maryland, the Maryland Longitudinal Data System Center, um, and they are able to get visibility for our Maryland graduates who enter into the Maryland workforce. However, there's uh, a limitation that we do not see those Maryland graduates if they start working in DC, even if they remain a resident of Maryland, start working in DC, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Delaware. Um, so P by joining up with PSEO and providing higher education data to the census, uh, we will start to get visibility into uh, elements around that. We won't be able to see that a specific uh, a specific student works at a particular organization and how much they make. We will get back aggregate aggregated data tables, but that will still give our institutions quite quite a bit of information to better understand where students are are going to and in what industries. Um, there is a PSEO co coalition, um, and in light of a recent bill, that Senate Bill 444 and House Bill 634, both MHEC and MLDS, MLDS staff have been uh, meeting with the PSEO coalition to figure out how we can get our Maryland data into this um, census opportunity. Um, our next step would be working on a data sharing agreement with, uh, with PSEO and um, thinking through uh, the data structures. We will have to revise, we will have to create dedicated data files in the way and manner that census requires. So that's going to take a bit of energy. Uh, wanted to put this on everybody's radar. Um, I don't think we've had an opportunity to speak about this specifically at the Segmental Advisory Council and wanted to make sure you were all aware that MHEC would be engaging in this initiative in partnership with MLDS in light of Senate Bill 444 and House Bill 634. Questions, comments, Matt. I wasn't even gonna raise my hand because I figured you'd know I was gonna say something. Um, so <laughs> we did talk about this about a year ago um, at this meeting when we were first investigating it collectively. And I think at that time, there were some concerns about the, the resource impact it would have on MHEC. So then we worked to pass the bill to allow MLDS to be the entity that would do the work and 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 work with Census Bureau. Um, and now MHEC prefers to be the entity to do that work. And as a policy agency for the state, that makes sense. I, I think the biggest interest is just making sure it happens and making sure that it actually gets done so we can all benefit from this data. All segments will benefit from it um, to be able to see the certificate information, to be able to see the degrees. And so um, is there any sort of timeline proposed for um, entering the MOU or acquiring the resources necessary to actually begin the work? Because we have been talking about it for over a year now. Absolutely. So I think uh, certainly we're going to, we started the conversation to figure out um, what that data sharing agreement would look like. Um, 
Ann and Barbara have been the ones leading the charge and meeting with the coalition and with census uh, representatives. So they already have a sense of the file layout. Um, we will have to make some decisions uh, about specific data elements, who's included, who's not, um, and and thinking through through that. And then ultimately the, the heavy lift is creating the file. We need to make some decisions about, um, do we just work on the most recent year right now and give them one year of data? Do we try to, how far back do we go? Um, it would be great if we, the, the expectation is to build the system so that it can be a rinse and repeat than necessarily having to rebuild. But because of changes in the collections in the past, we're gonna have to account for that. So there's a little bit of, thinking and planning and preparing. First step is the data sharing agreement. Um, our hope is, and our, our goal, but please don't hold us completely accountable to this, is that we get into the next collection year, which I think is sometime this summer. Is It's a once a year, we give it to census and they, they turn it, they actually give it back to us to make sure that we're okay with the final file layout. Um, so they do their own validation checks. So we'll actually get to see it again before they completely deposit it into their system and produce their reports. Um, so our hope is to get into the next cycle. Um, it, that's our goal. So we're not um, completely abandoning this, but we have realized that this is going to take someone's time uh, to do this work and thinking through how we get uh, that resource. We're trying to think creatively um, knowing that we are in uh, a budget, um, we have a sensitive budget this year. Um, so thinking through philanthropic dollars, um, other how, so that's part of the conversations with the coalition is seeing how other states have done this. Um, because in some ways it's a short-term funding need. Uh, we get this done for two, three years, and then it is a rinse and repeat. Um, but it's getting it set up um, and getting the system in place to, to do that is gonna take a minute. Does that help answer your question, Matt? Okay. Other comments, concerns? Really, we want to make you aware that we are, are going to be sharing higher education data with census. It has not been Maryland's practice to um, share data like this with, with other entities outside of MLBS. Um, which is why the data sharing agreement will be so critical to ensure that we have all the appropriate uh, protections, privacy elements in place. Uh, but knowing that census is already working with individual institutions and some statewide partners, um, that, that gives us uh, a bit of confidence in this, in this work. Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts on PSEO? Okay, upcoming reports. Just a friendly reminder, uh, we have a number of upcoming reports due, uh, best practice memo uh, due September 20th, um, overdose reporting, a memo is forthcoming on that. That is something we've been asking every year per, per statute. I do wanna say and remind everybody on the credit for prior learning report. This is uh, an anomaly. Um, MHEC is not a pass-through agency for the, the statute. Institutions are supposed to be submitting uh, this report to both the General Assembly and the Commission at the same time. Um, so we provide support to the colleges when they reach out and they're like, wait a minute, how do I submit a report to the General Assembly? But if you can echo this sentiment that they need to work with their gov government affairs folks um, to get that report submitted to the General Assembly, we do not submit on their behalf. Um, we do have a general suggested file layout, but institutions are not required to um, follow that layout. And uh, like I said, a memo forthcoming, this is the second year that this report is due. And then finally, access to contraception, uh, compliance with uh, the two bills that were talked about uh, earlier. Uh, we will ask for a status update by November 1st of where campuses are in uh, creating their plans um, and what kind of supports they need. So we're in, so we'll send out that memo providing all the contact information of our earlier presenters and also ask institutions to provide, you know, a, a one page summary update of, of where they are in implementation. Brad, 
Yes. Just really quickly for this credit for prior learning report, mm -hmm. is there, I mean, it makes more sense that it would be something that goes to MHEC then distributed to the general assembly. I mean, you could actually do something with it versus. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so I mean, we, maybe we, that's something we could fix. Yeah, I think it's a technical fix, but I, we, and so we'll take, we need them. They're supposed to be submitted to us, but unlike other reports where we collect them, then submit to the General Assembly. I just want to be clear, this is one report where campuses are supposed to be submitting to the General Assembly. We have okay. given them to the General Assembly, to the to the library. Um, they have, they, last year they requested, and happily we'll give it to them, but just want to be clear that campuses, at least as it's written right now, should submit to the General Assembly. Okay. Okay. Um, advisory councils. A number of advisory councils um, require some uh, either uh, immediate, short term, or long term representation. Each of these um, will get their own memo. Um, some of them we've already reached out to you for. Some of them we just need to refill vacancies. Uh, so again, just wanted to put this out on your radar that this is all forthcoming um, to get final um, representation. Some of these we will be um, scheduling the first meeting in short order. Faculty and student, they have standing meetings, so they are kind of an exception to this. Uh, but in short order, we need to schedule the program review process advisory council um, and the advisory council on workforce shortage. We would like to convene staff before the end of the uh, calendar year. Um, so those are our priorities for advisory council representation and forthcoming meetings. So please do keep an eye out. Some of these require a segmental representative. representative. Some of them we ask for your help in coordinating getting campus representative. So I will try to make those memos and announcements as clear as possible that we need a segmental representative or we need you to help coordinate getting a campus representative, depending on uh, the advisory council composition. Yes, question, Matt. Sorry, just to clarify, did you say only stack is gonna meet by the end of the year or the other oh, ones are gonna meet as well, correct? Yes, and I think they're gonna meet multiple times before the end of the year. Stack, we, I would like to convene at least once before the end of the year. So program review process advisory council and the workforce shortage advisory council, those um, scheduling emails will go out this week. House Bill 1244 implementation updates. Um, we've uh, provided updates to our commissioners at every commission meeting in, uh, on one topic or another for the past uh, three or four months now. Um, our priority is uh, getting the workforce needs analysis out. We provided a summary uh, along with Department of Labor on how we are going to identify workforce need and the accompanying academic programs at the August commission meeting. Um, I strongly encourage you to watch that because it provides very detailed uh, information on the, the process uh, some data decisions we've made uh, in collaboration with Department of Labor and Commerce and what that preview is going to look like. Our expectation is that this workforce needs analysis will go out by the end of this month and it will be a draft. It will have four components to it. It will have uh, uh, in-demand occupations, academic programs that are aligned with those occupations, um, emerging fields, uh, per an analysis by labor and uh, the, oh, I'm forgetting the term now, I wanna be very specific. It is uh, emerging academic programs. It's the language that is used in House Bill 1244 that has a very specific definition around emerging programs that are related to the emerging fields. So it's gonna be a four part analysis. We're gonna put it out for public comment for, for certainly you all as uh, segment leaders, uh, but for the campuses to respond and uh, provide some feedback. Um, we're going to be looking for feedback on two things. One, the process, um, just comments on how we've made some decisions about inclusion and exclusion on these various lists, as well as um, specific um, occupations or academic programs that we may have missed. 
and a justification for their inclusion um, in the list or a, a request for exclusion on the list. So those are going to be the two big things that we want to hear from you all on uh, for this workforce needs analysis. We will give you as much time as possible, a little bit more than two or three weeks um, to review that. We'll have some kind of survey uh, for campuses to respond, uh, and then we'll take it back to the commission uh, for, for their review. Mission statement review, we're going to provide uh, an update at this upcoming uh, commission meeting uh, on Wednesday. Uh, with a timeline and uh, kind of proposed um, proposed elements of the mission statement review. That is specific to our public uh, colleges and universities. Um, but Matt, I look to you. Uh, Mickey, where you may want to um, pay attention to that and just be aware of, of what the expectations are. Um, we've also been working through the standards for unreasonable duplication and unnecessary duplication. We will likely have uh, some more information for our commissioners at the October commission meeting. Uh, so more to come on that front in terms of the standards. And then finally, again, uh, convening that program review process advisory committee as quickly as possible. Matt. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I, I had thought in a previous meeting uh, that the commission was going to be adopting some of the standards and regs at the upcoming meeting, even though it's the budget meeting. Is that no longer happening or will they be presented to the commission on Wednesday? No, they will. They are not on the agenda for Wednesday. OK, and then just a quick follow up um, <clears throat> as we were sort of describing it to um, our board that the commission would sort of be adopting whether it's September, October. And then the, there would be feedback through institutions and through the program review process advisory committee, presumably. Um, but if they're adopted in October, that's right around the corner. And so our folks are just concerned about how we're really going to be able to influence it if the commission adopts it. And I know you're under huge time constraints with the legislative policy committee and ALR, but um, can you just walk us through how that that will all work and how the segments can sort of contribute to it and, and help guide it and influence it? Because it's Absolutely. obviously a huge interest to everyone on this call. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we will, I, I haven't been able to think through that timeline um, with specificity, but there will be an opportunity either through the program review process advisory committee or through some other mechanism for you all to provide feedback um, before it goes to AALR. We'd like to be able to get that feedback before AALR. Um, so that we can we can make adjustments or account for it um, as needed. So I don't think I have a good answer for you on on how to make sure, but you have our commitment that you'll have an opportunity to to see it, preview it, and provide feedback um, before it goes to AALR. So sorry. for that, sorry, Emily, but I mean, I, once it goes to AALR, it's it's completely baked, right? So and even after LPC agrees and adopts it, our ability to have influence or say on is extremely limited. So I think I think the biggest concern for at least my folks is that we're able to see something and provide feedback before the commission adopts it to start the ball rolling. Understood. I hear you. Hear is, you. There, is, is there a commitment on that part too? That, that <laughs> yes. I mean, you feedback there. Yeah, you'll, yes, absolutely. We'll make sure that you all have an opportunity to review it before before it goes to ALR. We want to get that feedback before it goes to ALR because if we get that feedback through ALR, then like let's just get ahead of that if there are concerns or issues that the campuses are going to raise. Right, but just to be clear, we're looking for feedback before it goes to the commission for adoption rather than right. ALR. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So Emily, I think there are two things. Uh, what mm -hmm. Matt is saying that they would like to give input before it goes to commission, not before it goes to ALR, right? Yep. So let's see what we can do to, to address that. I know there is a tremendous time constraint, but I think uh, you know having that input uh, will be very helpful. Absolutely. Understood. We will, we will work through the, the scheduling to make that all happen. Matt, would you um, feel comfortable if it's going through the program review process advisory committee? Would that? Yeah, I think logically okay. speaking, that would that would convene prior to 
it going to the commission, right? The advisory committee is there to advise the commission. So presumably they would want to hear from that body prior to Perfect. adopting. Perfect. Great. So it may be through that committee that we burn our feedback. Okay. More to come then on that front. Great. Okay. Uh, last item um, that is not on the agenda, so I hope I have everyone's um, permission to just add this other other topic. Uh, again, through the Moore Miller uh, state plan, there is interest in better understanding co-ops or cooperative education opportunities. Um, these are, as many of you know, uh, kind of bigger uh, or different than internship opportunities. So on the slide here is just a summary of, of kind of those descriptors um, to distinguish between co-ops versus internships. What we will be doing uh, in sometime this week is making a call out. We don't have a database of academic programs that leverage co-ops, but we know many of the campuses leverage this kind of educational model uh, to support students getting exposure to industry, working on specialized projects, uh, developing rapport with employers and the like. Uh, so we'd like uh, campuses to report back on just academic programs that leverage the co-op model, not programs that leverage internships, but specifically this broad concept of what we mean by cooperative education. Um, we then will follow up with the, uh, with the applicable academic programs, better understand. Uh, this is being sourced primarily from Department of Labor and how we can connect our colleges with employers um, and embed this model a little bit more explicitly in uh, some of the specific STEM fields. Uh, so this is just to, to get a sense of who actually offers cooperative education. They may call it something different, but uh, internship plus uh, opportunities um, so that we can talk with those academic programs with more specificity uh, and better understand how they do that work. Um, so to summarize, lots of memos forthcoming on all of these topics um, and an email reminder um, for RSVPs for the Student Success Summit. That is all I have for you today. <laughs> and I think that takes us to the end of the agenda. Questions, broad questions, comments, concerns. We can move to member updates. If you have important updates, please go ahead. I'll just quickly say I'll see you, Mr. Secretary, at uh, Deborah Casey's inauguration on Friday, the third president of Warwick. So that's one of the, I guess, the only thing we got going on that's a big deal this week. Well, I tell you, I will be there, but I will also be at the ribbon cutting of the STEM Center at Tacoma Park campus of Mount uh, Memory College. Yep, yep. State of the art, the state of the art STEM teaching facility. A lot of great things are happening. Thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your attention today. We uh, went through some really important topics complex topics. Um, I want to thank you for, for your suggestions, input, and more importantly, your ongoing thinking on these topics and making sure that you take this information to your stakeholders and bring their input back. Some things, uh, you, you know, are time bound, so that's an issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, we want to make sure and whatever we do, whether it's 2030 or this academic uh, program approval, or how do we provide financial assistance to our students uh, in the best possible way, we want to do this in the most collaborative way possible. These are complex uh, issues. Uh, there are constraints. Financial constraints are certainly there. We can't, uh, you know, ignore that. But given that, I think we have ample of opportunities to, to do good work. I want to thank you. Uh, I want to visit more campuses. Every time I go to a campus, I learn something and I come back 
and Dr. Dow and others, they keep hearing about those things from me. So it's a great work is happening. I want to thank you. And again, on Wednesday, just uh, you know, another uh, 48 hours or so from today, we'll be in our building here. We'll be listening to your presentations on your budgets. Uh, that's a very important uh, activity of the year. And here also, you know, commissioners have asked for certain information. Again, you know, that's our opportunity to, to talk more about wonderful things that are happening on our campuses. So again, thank you. Have a great day.